Welcome everyone to the Department of Justice Fiscal Year 2019 CTAF Application Final Question and Answer Webinar. My name is Christina and I will be your moderator for today. Our presenters and panelists today are various subject matter experts from the Department of Justice. Leading off our discussions today will be Kara McDonough. Good afternoon, this is Kara McDonough and I work with the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. We wanted to welcome you today to our final pre-application webinar for the Coordinated Tribal Assistance Solicitation. We are going to have just a few slides with some relevant information, and then we're going to spend the rest of the time taking your questions, uh, anything that you want to ask at this time prior to submitting your application, we'd love to answer for you. Just a reminder, the DOJ components that are involved in the CTAS process, the Community Oriented Policing Services Office, the Office on Violence Against Women, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, the Office on Victims of Crime, and the Bureau of Justice Assistance. And we have representatives from these offices here today to answer your questions. A reminder, the solicitation opened on Tuesday, November 27th, and closes next week on March 12th, 2019. A reminder that the closing time is 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. DOJ expects to award these grants no later than December 30th of this year, and all project start dates should be on or after October 1st of 2019. We also wanted to remind you that the Tribal Justice website is available for you. It has all kinds of information about CTAS. We're gonna show you in slides following exactly where to access that information. But these are resources that we've pulled together and we hope that they're helpful to you as you finish your application. On the Tribal Justice and Safety website, you'll see indicated by the red arrow on the left side of the screen that if you click the CTAS, it will take you to a number of other options for you. And if you click on Open Solicitations, you'll find a number of different documents that we recommend that you spend a lot of time with. We know this is a very dense application and that there's a lot to keep track of. And so these are all here. Um, in particular, we wanted to call your attention to the general FAQs and to the general fact sheet along with the templates. Um, we also wanted to call your att attention to the FY19 CTAS timeline template. If you'll notice, it's the second entry under the general templates for CTAS FY 2019. This is not a required uh, template, but it is uh, an example for you. We know that there's been questions about the timeline. This year, there were some changes to our uh, timeline. And so we wanted to call your attention to where that template is located. In addition, there were a series of CTAS webinars this year. You'll see that the topics ranged from a CTAS overview and a budget development overview to uh, purpose area specific webinars, an application checklist and question and answer, which was completed on February 12th. You will notice on the right hand side of your screen um, two different places where you can access the archived webinars. You can also access them through the website where we just were, which is if you click on training and technical assistance, it will open up to another series of things, the new grantee orientation materials and other training events. And then the bottom choice there is webinars. And if you click there, you'll be able to listen to those archived webinars there were questions and answers that were posed to the facilitators of those webinars. And again, they will be available to you by listening to the archived webinar. There's also a, um, important websites that you may want to access. We just went through the first one, which is the key CTAS documents. As you're putting your budget together, you may want to reference the DOJ Grants Financial Guide. 
Um, the grants management system is the system where you actually submit your applications. The tribal justice website we just went through. There's also a grants resource guide, which is more general information on grant writing. The COPS office website has information about Purpose Area 1 and other kinds of programs that are funded by the COPS office. And the Office of Justice Programs website, again, has uh, the other purpose areas other than the uh, purpose area five, which is OVW. But you'll also find other uh, contextual information about the Office of Justice Programs. Purpose area five, OVW, their website is the last one on this bulleted list. So we have two other specific uh, help desks that we think are going to be really very important to you as you complete your application. The first one is specifically for CTAS questions. Phone number is 1-800-421-6770, and the email is tribalgrants at usdoj.gov. And the second one is a GMS help desk, and the support hotline for that is 888-549-9901. And you'll press option three, and the email is gmshelpdesk at usdoj.gov. That is a place where if you get into GMS, and we're hoping that you get in early because it is uh, a process to submit your application once everything is done. If you get in there and you have any kind of technical glitches, if you're having trouble um, understanding which button to push or if things aren't showing up the way that you wanted them to, or any any kind of technical issue that you're having with GMS, the GMS support hotline is the place to call. And they are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we're gonna open this webinar up for questions from you all at this time. Please feel free to write your question in the question and answer box and we'll read them out loud, and our subject matter experts here in the office and on the line will respond to them. Great, thank you, Kara. So we do have some questions, and the first question is, what are the required application documents that must be included in the submission? The required documents are the budget and detail workbook, and if you're applying for Purpose Area 1, in addition to those two, you need to make sure that you do the demographic form, it's all also the tribal and community justice profile and a purpose area narrative for each purpose area that you're applying to. And another question is, what is the indirect allowability for the following? Capital purchases, contracted trainings, subrecipient agreements, in purpose area one, any wages for a police department not associated with the tribe? Uh, I'll try to answer the first three in reference to indirect costs for uh, contracts, subawards, and procurement or capital expenditures. For capital expenditures, uh, they need to be removed from the indirect cost proposal. For um, procurement items, um, you'd have, I'd have to get back at you specifically for that, but for, in, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, subrecipient, uh, well, let, let me see, I think I can answer that. For contracts, there is no um, specific threshold or requirement. For subrecipient agreements, the threshold is for the first $25,000. So I'll repeat that. So if you're talking about indirect costs for capital expenditures like equipment, they cannot be a part of the um, proposal or those items need to be removed from the indirect cost uh, calculations. For contracts, According to the uh, guidelines, uh, contracts, you can apply the entire indirect cost rate to the contract. However, for subawards, you can only apply the first $25,000 of that subaward uh, for towards that particular subaward, regardless of the duration of that particular subaward. I'm going to answer the question for the COPS office, for Purpose Area 1, regarding the police officer. If you're referring to, to hiring an officer under the COPS office, it has to be a career law enforcement officer. And by that, I mean that the COPS office stature 
defines a career law enforcement officer as an officer hired on a permanent basis who is authorized by law or by state or local public agency to engage in or to supervise the prevention, detection, or investigation of criminal law violations. Now also, you can hire for tribal con conservation office eligible to apply. Now if the tribe has a conservation department, it has to have primary law enforcement authority. It is eligible to receive grant funding under Prep Area 1 as part of a tribe single application. For clarity, as, as stated in the solicitation, applicants must have an established law enforcement agency and existing contract with the Bureau of Indian Affairs for law enforcement services or existing contract with or local agency for law enforcement services. And we provide full-time eligible salaries and benefits for sworn law enforcement officer positions. And another question is, for the tribal community and justice section, will every grant reviewer read this, even if they are only reading Purpose Area 3 or Purpose Area 9, for example? I don't want to have to repeat lots of information so that I can best utilize my page limitations. To answer your question, yes. You only have to do one tribal community and justice profile, and the peer reviewers get that along with your other application documents. So if you, for example, apply to Purpose Area 1, 2, 3, and 6, they will get your individual purpose area narratives, they will get your budgets, they will get the one tribal and community justice profile, and they, they already know and familiar with the application and know that you only have to submit one. And if an applicant is not a high-risk applicant, are they obligated to submit the disclosure in the application, or would they not include a disclosure for that at all? Yes, you still have to disclose. You can just simply say, I am not on the high-risk list, or however you want to word it. We just need to know if you are, that you are, and if you're not, that you're not. And there's, in the slides, on one of the previous webinars, there's some slides on there that give more detailed information on that, but you, if you are, you want to put the date of the designation, the reason for the designation, and the name and contact of the info of the designating agency if it wasn't DOJ, or even if it was DOJ. And again, if you're not on the high-risk high risk list, you can simply say we're not designated as high-risk by DOJ or any other agency. Just an FYI, if you are on the, on the designated list, Access to funds may be withheld if you don't designate whether or not you are high risk on your application. So your funds can be held up until we find that out. And are we allowed to shorten the template questions to make room for our answers? Absolutely, you can. However, I would just make sure that if you do do that, that you have a list of, of the questions as they're written in the templates next to you so that you don't make the mistake of answering the shortened version versus, versus what we actually asked you. But you can certainly shorten, or you can remove them if you want to. For example, you could say if we ask you 10 questions for purpose area six, I'm just making this up, this is an example. If purpose area six asks you 10 questions, you could put a statement at the top of your Word document to say, I am answering the questions for purpose area six in order of the way that they were listed in the provided template. Question one, and just write your answer, and we will know based on that statement that you're answering them in order. As a response to the uh, first question for Purpose Area 1 and um, Police Department, there was some clarification that the wages would be for a dispatcher, and would that be allowed? And the answer to that is that it's not allowed for a dispatcher. And does the timeline have to be in the narrative or can it be submitted as a separate document? Also, is this the same for all purpose areas? Yes, the timeline is required to be a part of the purpose area narrative for each purpose area that an applicant applies for. However, in an effort to maximize application space, applicants are able to use a smaller font, no smaller than size nine, for their timeline and or submit an abbreviated version of their timeline in the narrative, as well as a more detailed timeline as a separate attachment. If an applicant chooses this approach, it is highly recommended that the applicant references in the narrative that a more detailed timeline is attached. And are replacement units allowable for CTAS funded officers? Can you ask for more clarity on what that means? Yeah, what is a replacement? I, I think I know, but I just want to be clear. Certainly. 
And while we wait for clarification, another question is, is there a form for applicant disclosure of high risk status or does a letter need to be completed even if there's no high risk status? How should the section be addressed on the checklist, page 57 under G, labeled small g? So there isn't an actual required form or a template that we provided for that. If you look in the solicitation, as well as the previous webinar um, presentations, we provided how you could go about listing that information. If you are high risk, you just simply need, it can be a, a Word document that just simply says high risk status at the top, and then you would give the following three pieces of information. The name and contact information of the designating agency, meaning the agency that put you on high risk, the date of your designation of high risk, and the reason for it. If you are not designated high risk, you can simply still do the same thing. Just create a Word document. At the top of it, it says high risk designation. You could simply put a statement that says we are not designated high risk by DOJ or any other federal agency. I was able to identify some issues where the financial budget workbook is not working correctly. I just want to be sure that if we choose to use our own budget spreadsheet and narrative that we will not be penalized as long as it contains all of the same information that your template asks for. Is that okay? Yes, that's okay. You can use any format you want. I would just make sure that it has the information in that that we're asking for and that it's computed correctly, that you triple check your calculations. If you could send an email into tribal grants at US doj.gov to let us know what problems you may have identified so that we can get that looked at. So we can just make sure that it's not a larger issue or if it is, we can get it addressed because it's our first time hearing it. If the problem potentially is that uh, like in the narrative section, if you're having trouble creating a space between the different line items that you're describing in the narrative, uh, somebody mentioned in one of our previous webinars that if you hit alt enter, it'll let you use the enter function within that, that cell for the narrative portion. I would also just add the triple check that you're enabling your macros for the Excel spreadsheet. Sometimes that causes problems. And another follow-up for purpose area number one, and in indirect, what is allowable under purpose area one for wages? Regarding the question, um, you can feel free to go to the Tribal Justice website and look at the 2019 allowable and unallowable cost list for top purpose area one, where we outline specifically what's allowed under the personnel as well as the fringe benefits. But by and large, all of the salaries are direct costs. We also itemize the fringe benefit items, um, again, on our allowable and unallowable cost list. And then as a follow-up to that, is the tribe allowed to charge the indirect for the wages under Purpose Area 1? Yes, if that's your indirect cost rate agreement, if that stipulates that. Um, there are no indirect costs associated with direct salary costs. And we have another question. Are infrastructure activities eligible under, the purpose, under purpose Area Number 1? For example, installation of solar panel carports for existing tribal police vehicles. That would be included in your accessory package as far as installation, but we do not pay for installation separately. And a question about high risk. Can high risk be economically distressed by Denali Commission? I'm not sure I understand the question. I, I will, however, say that if they're asking if there's a way to get out of the high risk status for some type of reason, that's not a decision we make. In most cases, your high risk designation is not removed until you meet the requirements under. Usually when you're designated high risk, there's things that you have to do and things that DOJ or whatever federal agency put you on high risk wants to see and they want to make sure that those things are completed before that status is removed. Please have that person provide more clarity on exactly what they're asking. And just as a follow-up, they're asking if you can define high risk. The high risk designation is a designation that is given to organizations by a federal agency based on some manner of deficiency that was noted in their award uh, management. An organization or a tribe should know if they have been designated high risk. It's a particular status 
that is denoted by a formal letter that comes from a federal agency. It's not an informal designation, um, and it wouldn't be something that the leadership of your tribe would not know about. It would be something that they would know about. If, the, if there's any clarification that's needed with that, please, you know, whoever asked it, you can go ahead and, and give us more information. And what are some allowable and unallowable costs that one can apply for in each purpose area? Each purpose area has various allowable and unallowable costs. Please review the solicitation, specifically Section F, which is purpose area specific information, where each particular purpose area provides a listing of allowable and unallowable costs. And is there a template or required format for the project or pro program timeline? No, there is no required format. However, it is recommended that applicants submit a timeline or milestone chart for each purpose area they are applying for, encompassing the entire period of performance for the proposed project. Recommended that it indicates objectives and major tasks, assigns responsibility for each, and plots completion of each task by year and then by month or quarter for the whole award. Um, there is an attached template, which is just an example. Uh, I mean, when I say attached, I mean, it is on our Tribal Justice and Safety website. And if you look at the prior slides, we indicated exactly where it was under the open solicitation under CTAS. There's an example of a template that you can use for the timeline, but it's not, that particular template is not required. And what are the page limit requirements for the purpose area narratives? The page limit requirement is 10 pages for all purpose areas with the exception of purpose area 3 and 10. Purpose area 3 and 10 have a page limit requirement in the terms of a range from 10 to 15 pages. So you can't, for purpose area 3 and 10, you can't submit more than 15, but you can submit up to 15. And for all the other purpose areas, it's up to 10 pages. And is there a page limit to attachments? And are attachments included as part of the page overall page limit? There is no page limit for, um, for attachments, but if you include an attachment within your profile or narrative document, it will count against the page limits. The page limits are specified for certain documents. Please refer to solicitation for further guidance. For example, there is a page limit for a tribal community and justice profile up to 10 pages. Purpose area narratives, Again, for all purpose areas except purpose area three and 10. For purpose area narratives, the limit is 10. For purpose area three and 10, the narrative page limits is up to 15 pages. I would recommend noting that you have an attachment for your tribal and community justice profile and upload this document in, other, in the other attachment section so that it won't exceed the page limit limits on the profile of the narrative documents. In short, just to bring that back home, you know, for all attachments that aren't required documents, most of them do not have page limits. I know some folks have been asking whether or not can they just submit one giant file with all the, I would not recommend that. A, it, it could be corrupt. B, you don't want us to think that you didn't submit something that you did. So I would be very clear in submitting separate attachments. It's not a requirement, it's just a suggestion. Separate attachments and making sure that each attachment has a name that we would know what it is. If you're not calling it exactly what we call it, for example, we say budget detail workbook and narrative, that's what we say in the solicitation. But if you just want to say my budget for purpose area three, that's fine. We'll know what that is. That's close enough. But we don't want to overlook any of your documents. So I wouldn't recommend combining things. And regarding the timeline, can you provide an example of what you are looking for? Estimated start of task and ex expected completion of tasks are we to list this as year, quarter, and month time frame? So it should be based on 36 months because um, the awards are for three years. So it's, you know, you should be basing it on 36 months. Also, we have an example on the Tribal Justice website under general CTAS templates. It's the second document underneath of the Tribal and Community Justice Profile. And just to give you a little bit more idea of probably what that could look like. If you're doing this and you follow our example that we have on the website, you can have estimated start of task, 
you want to identify what purpose area is for your project goals, any related objectives, activities, expected completion date of the task or activities, and the person responsible for doing that. And if you don't, for example, have a person's name, I don't think we necessarily need it that detail, but if you ask for positions in any of the purpose area, we would probably be expecting to see those positions creating some, completing some of those tasks, so you'd want to identify that. Um, if you want to include the person's name and actual position, that's fine too, but it just needs to be something that we can identify a position or a person um, with. And can I include all attachments to the tribal profile instead of separate attachments to the tribal profile and purpose area narrative? I'm not 100% sure if I understand your question, but I'm going to answer what I think you're saying. And if I am not correct, please come back and provide more clarity. You could, if you wanted to, submit one or two big attachments. I would strongly suggest you not doing that for the simple fact that there are three required documents and there's other supporting documents that each office asks for and that we ask for as a whole. You run the serious risk of something being overlooked or left out if you're combining huge attachments. So I would recommend that you do not do that. I recommend that you submit your budget as a separate attachment, you submit your tribal and community justice profile as a separate attachment, you submit your purpose area narrative for each purpose area that you're applying for as a separate attachment, you submit resumes, you know, support letters, anything else that the purpose area may be asking you for, all of those should be separate attachments and they should be clearly labeled as such. And there's another question and that is, Three years ago, we used CTAS funds for three officer units who were COPS funded. Two of those vehicles are no longer available for use due to wear and tear, et cetera. Right. Those two vehicles are now pretty much um, has ended its uh, life expected cycle, and the department still needs um, new vehicles. Absolutely. Police vehicles are an eligible request under COPS Purpose Area 1, and just because you received a vehicle in the past does not preclude you from applying for another one. Where is the applicant disclosure forms for the high-risk status disclosure of pending applications and lobbying activities? There's a link for that, and the disclosure of pending applications is created by the applicant. The disclosure written statement should include both direct applications for federal funding, um, easy yeah. applications, to federal agencies and indirect applications for such funding, i.e. examples for state agencies and sub-grant federal awards. The written statement should include the federal or state funding agency name, the solicitation name, purpose area or project name, the point of contact information at the appropriate funding agency. And there is a link, but you can find that in some of our prepared questions. Is Cellbrite equipment an allowable cost for officers? This equipment would allow officers to download cell phone information of computer info if permission has been provided. Yes, that is an allowable cost. To confirm, um, the forms that were discussed, the, the form for disclosure lobbying, um, those need to be submitted with the application, correct? Correct. And can an Excel spreadsheet be included in the narrative section of the workbook budget? We do not recommend adding an Excel spreadsheet within the budget narrative, budget worksheet. We have a limited number of characters within each text box within the budget worksheet. So we recommend that the applicant, if you need to submit an additional Excel spreadsheet, you can do so as a separate additional attachment. Uh, but as was mentioned earlier, please make sure that you label each of your documents so we understand what this information is for and for which purpose area. And there is a question of where are the signature lines? And I believe that's referencing back to the disclosure and the lobbying forms. So just to be clear, the disclosure and high risk stuff is completely separate from their assurances and certification. For their high risk designation and the lobbying stuff, you're gonna follow the instructions we gave you on how to create a document to do that. You don't need to worry about any signature lines for that. For the CTAS certifications and insurances, which I'm pretty sure that's what the person is talking about, those are signed electronically. And so when you submit your application, so there's not going to be a physical signature line for that. The only way that would happen is if you were submitting your application via like a paper application. So essentially, when you submit your application, you're signing the certs and insurances. 
The next question is, it's regarding purpose area number five, the narrative template. Within the template, it includes a keyword bank and it instructs you to check the topics or areas that your project substanti um, substantially addresses. This keyword bank takes up to two pages of the narrative. There's four parts to this question. Is this required information needed for the narrative? Can this be attached as a separate document? Can the boxes or topics that are not checked be deleted? And can it be simplified into a paragraph minus the check boxes? We have a list of things there for our office. We're collecting data and it's very helpful to us, so that's why it's there. But you can certainly delete the things that you don't need. So out of, and I forgot how many items are there, it may be like 12 or 13 items, it may be more than that. Let's just say only four apply to you. You could check those four or list those four out and completely de delete the rest. However, I will issue this caveat. I need you to pay very close attention to that list and just, just don't simply go through checking things because let's just say, for example, someone from your program is attending an event on one of those topics. That does not count. It means if your program is actually actively addressing this issue substantially, should you be checking those items? Thank you. And if the Excel spreadsheet has a limit of 2,000 characters per item, then if we use our own budget, Will we, will we be held to 2,000 characters when justifying each item? No, if you use your own format, you're, you use your own format. There's no character limitation on your own format. It's just with Excel, you can only allow but so many characters for preset budgets. So if you run out of space, for example, if you're writing your budget narrative and you run out of space, you are welcome to submit a Word document entitled Budget Narrative and give more clarity on those items if you feel like you don't have enough space for that. I would just note that that is what you're doing. Where does the statement of high risk need to be included in? It can simply be a separate attachment, label the document, the Word document, disclosure of high risk status, simply answer the questions that we're asking you to answer, and submit it as an attachment. Just make sure it's clearly labeled as to what that attachment is. And do we submit a letter if we do not lobby? All applicants must disclose existence or non-existence of lobbying activities by completing and submitting the form SFLL with your 2019 CTAS application. We read the link earlier. The link is also in the form pre previous presentation slides. It's in the FAQs that we sent out. You can always email tribalgrants at usdoj.gov and get the link directly sent to you as well. How can I download CTAS documents? So you're going to go into GMS as if you were going to, and then you just simply go. So it's grant the the address that you would use or the website link. It's grants.ojp.usdoj.gov backslash ctas backslash, and it'll take you directly to where the documents you should be using are in GMS. Do not use the documents on the tribal justice website. They have sample written all across them. The content is the same, but those are not the documents we want you to use. We want you to use the ones that are in GMS that do not have the word sample written across them. And does the AOR need to sign the attachment of high risk? Yes. I would encourage applicants to go back and look at our checklist, checklist webinar that we held on February 12th. It can be found at the OJP YouTube website, which is www.youtube.com backslash user backslash OJP OCOM and on www.justice.gov backslash tribal backslash webinars. All the links that we've been referencing and talking about today are in that webinar and in that webinar presentation. I would also encourage applicants to remember that this year we did a little something different with the three required documents, which are the budget and detail workbook to include the demographic form if you're applying for purpose area one, the purpose area narrative for each purpose area that you're applying for, and the tribal community and justice profile. So when you get to the end and you're about to submit, the system is going to recognize if you have not uploaded those documents. So for example, if you're tribal community justice profile isn't there, but your purpose area and narrative for each purpose area and your budget are there, you still won't be able to submit. So if any of those documents are missing, you won't be able to submit. By the same token, if you have applied to three purpose areas 
you have your tribal community justice profile uploaded, you have your budget uploaded, and you have two out of three of the purpose area narratives that you're applying for uploaded, you still won't be able to submit because it will recognize, recognize that there's supposed to be three purpose area narratives and not two. So we did that in an effort to help you, but I will issue one last caveat. The system is only but so smart. So if you accidentally name a wrong document, one of those names and upload it, it's going to read it as if it's that document. Make sure that if you're calling something a budget, it actually is the budget. If you're calling something a purpose area five or purpose area six narrative, that it's in fact the appropriate narrative for that purpose area, because the system can't account for that type of human error. The other thing I would add to you, if hopefully everybody is going to be submitting their applications before next Tuesday, um, hopefully this week, to be honest. But by chance, if you are having any type of problems on the last day or you call the response center or you call one of us in this room or you're referred to a purpose area representative and by chance you are told to email your application in, you should stop exactly what you're doing and you should do exactly that and you should do it immediately. And if you are submitting more than one email, for example, if you're, I'm going to just use this example, if you're a UROC tribe and you're asked to email your application and it's, you know, it's going to be several emails, it should be example, UROC tribe CTAS 2019 application part one, the second email should have the same title, but say part two and so on. So that it's clearly labeled what it is, state who you spoke to in the email. Hopefully no one has to do this, but we had a lot of problems with folks not following directions last year. So we just want to make sure that it's very clear this year. If you're asked to do that, please do that. If you're given a GMS ticket number, please record that. If you do happen to call the GMS help desk for whatever reason, please may, be very firm with them that you need a ticket number. Do not get off of the phone until you get one. Great, thank you. And there was a question that I submitted an application but did not get an email confirmation. How do I know for certain that the application was actually submitted? GMS status says submitted, but with other online systems, we get an email confirmation. You will not get a confirmation from GMS. If it says it's submitted, it's submitted. But if you want to triple check, you can reach out to tribal grants at usdoj.gov, the response center, and they'll reach out to the appropriate purpose area contact. And we can we have confirmed in the past for applicants who were a little uneasy or unsure, but you won't get an email from GMS. And does the system save any items uploaded when we're not logged in? For example, my profile is done, but not the purpose area narrative. Yeah, once you click upload, it's saved. So if you've done some work a few weeks ago, anything that you uploaded would still be there. So yes, it, it should definitely still be there. And do any of our presenters or panelists have any additional tips or information they would like to share? I would just encourage everyone to, if possible, submit your application 72 hours in advance. Allow yourself time to take a break and read it and make sure that you're submitting everything appropriately. Also, a very common mistake is applicants will contact us the day after solicitation is closed and they've submitted, while they may have submitted all their documents, they've submitted them in either draft form or track changes form, and unfortunately, there's nothing we can do about that. We can't alter your application in any way, so just triple check that what you're actually submitting is what you actually meant to submit. There's nothing we can do to change your document after you've uploaded it and pressed submit. One other comment, just um, best of luck to everyone. Uh, we know that there's a lot of different directions and a lot of different documents, and um, a lot of resources and just really wishing everyone the best with, you know, pulling the rest of the application together and meeting the deadline. Really wanted to encourage you to use the help desks that are available to you. The GMS help desk, if you have any technical issues at all, um, call them. And if you don't get what you need, please document that and feel free to call them back. Um, also, the response center. The Response Center is specifically there. We fund them to be available to you for any questions that you might have. If you have a question at, at any point during the process, please use those two resources. And we do have an assessment process that happens at the end of after applications are in, and we send it out widely to our, um, to our listserv. And we really would like to hear your experience. Um, the good things about this application, 
the less than good things about this application, we take your feedback very seriously and we do our best to incorporate your comments and your feedback into the next year's iteration. So as you're doing your application, please do be, you know, keeping track of any kind of feedback that you might want to give us because we find it really valuable and we ask that you uh, be willing to share that with us during the assessment process. Previous webinars can be accessed and viewed at www.justice.gov backslash tribal backslash webinars. Thank you everyone for attending today's webinar and we hope you have a great day.